welcome to the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. I'm Mark Fernandes. Each week, along with my co-host Eric DeRosa, we aim to shatter the stigma around mental health conversations through kitchen table conversations with real and relatable people. All the while, reminding our audience that they are not alone. There is hope, there is help, and there is a way through. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 154. This is your co-host, Mark Fernandes, sitting in my usual seat in my studio, and across the creek is my ever-loving, I don't know why, but I'm feeling rock and rollish, so like, ever-loving, living, loving, I'm just a woman. <laughs> <laughs> they're just a woman. Or maybe they're not. Who knows? Eric DeRosa, how are Happy you? Happy Thursday evening. Good to see you. I'm in my usual location, but in a slightly different location in that room, so we're going to see how... Nobody That's puts right. baby in I'm, the closet. I've got all my toys behind me hanging on the wall and poised next to me. And interestingly enough, this week has been, I've had so many conversations around community and building community. I came out of a meeting just this afternoon down in Basalt talking about that whole idea of community. And I have to say, Mark, the last time I skied was Monday and it was with you prior to our meeting and a couple of our good friends. And it reminded me so much of the community that we've created, not only here on the show, but the community that we've created on the snow, the show in the snow. Um, yeah. My mind's kind of working in. We're, we're going to take the, we're gonna we take are going to take the, the show, show on the snow, snow but I wanted to thank you for that because it was super fun. And we, those days for us are so infrequent when you and I actually get to go out together, but it was fun. It was productive and it was great to get out there and see some of our friends and get a chance to ski with some of our friends as civilians. It was really cool. Yeah. It's funny. Like people get like shocked when they see me in my civvies. It's like, I, I ski way more than you probably know. And, but it is funny because Amy was talking about the fact, my Amy, my wife was somebody, we're actually going on a ski double date on Saturday with friends we've known for years was at their wedding, but we've never skied and ridden together. And our friend Alex said to Amy, like, what's it like skiing with your husband? She's like, well, he doesn't want to do the thing he usually does. So he's going to tell us what chairlift he's going to. And he'll wait, wait for us there. <laughs> and Alex was like, what do you like? She's like, oh, no, he's not going to lead you unless you ask him to. And he's not going to offer like he is just going to rip away. I usually yell at him for skiing too fast. And then we get on the chairlift and we tell some jokes and then we do it again. And I don't know if it's because I'm a trainer or like some of my status within the school or whatever it is, but they're, they think I'm like always on. And I'm like, no man, if I'm not in that red jacket. I'm honestly probably a bit of a loose cannon. <laughs> <laughs> and I think in many ways, that's what makes it so fun when I do get to go out there and you and I both together become a little bit of a hazard to all of the other folks that are on the snow although we're i'm more dangerous to myself yeah, than yeah. anyone else. but we're totally in control <laughs> <laughs> by the way yes. good thing we didn't ski yes. amf yeah 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 horrible gross, gross. yeah Probably. well I today's guest feeling. is in denver and i know she has mountain fomo because we talked about it before we came on the air so i'm not gonna make her hang out any longer is joining us on today's show is Laura Renner. Laura is an author, podcast host, and neonatal intensive care nurse who suffered a near fatal traumatic brain injury that changed the trajectory of her life. Through her complicated recovery, she hit rock bottom and realized she needed to undergo deep work to heal her complex trauma. She spent the last two years exploring countless trauma healing modalities and sharing her experience to show others they're capable of healing too. In her book, which is amazing, by the way, No, I'm Not Fine, Thank You, period, comma, quote, Laura openly discusses her journey of identifying her traumas, healing deep wounds, and how she reclaimed her power. She is also the host of her own podcast called Healing Hashtag No Filter, where she provides relatable, no-nonsense methods for healing your mind, body, and all things trauma-related. As she writes so well in her book, and I quote, being on this healing journey is a lot like running. Well, running for people who are not runners, myself included. With that, 
Let's go across the continental divide and welcome in Laura. Hi, Laura. How are you? Hi, Eric and Mark. I'm good. Thank you. And I really am suffering the mountain FOMO so badly. <laughs> well, get your ass up here. I know. I know. Got, I just kind of find the time. We got guest rooms. Can't wait. Yes. You can even, like, you get sick of one of us or you're like, hey, what's what's the place like over there? Like, you get to hang out with Chewie the dog here. You get to hang out with the cat over there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's right. We're not going to put you on snow, though. That's... No, no the, those days are behind. And if anybody wants get... to know why, when I rec- pick, up pick up the book. book. Yes, pick up the book. <laughs> I, love the, I love the title. Thank and I'm you. guessing that Eric's tagline that we've adopted it from Survivor to Thriver is that it's perfectly okay to not always be okay. And I take that so much to heart because I think it's one of the hardest things for me in my mental health journey has always been actually admitting when I'm not okay. I really suck at that. 100%. I think um, we all do. So the thing that I find so interesting, though, listening to your bio is having suffered trauma yourself, and I'm guessing the TBI was not the only trauma, and then you essentially work in a situation where you're faced with somebody's worst trauma or nightmare every day that you're at that job. Because NICU is no joke. I've had, we just had friends have premature twins. They're doing fantastic. But there was a month where they were in the NICU down in Denver. I might even be the hospital you're at. We'll talk about that after the call. Because if you met them, you'd remember them. They're very, they're very interesting people. And they did great. They managed it really well. But man, that's fucking hard. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I like to refer to it as my trauma on trauma because I experienced <laughs> so much in my personal life. But then also I would go to work and just deal with the wildest stuff. And just, yeah, people's worst nightmares. And that was just my daily routine for a decade. And now I'm dipping my toes back in with a very different lens. So that's been interesting. And it's been good, but definitely still weird, I will say. Did it ever occur to you before? So it sounds like you've come back into it after a lot of work on yourself. But before that work on yourself, did it ever occur to you that you were essentially like, whether it was a lens or a mirror or whatever it is that you were either pushing down or reliving your own traumas through other people's eyes? No, I mean, it was, it's funny. It's not funny. I think it's funny, but I used to go out to dinner week weekly with my friends and they'd be like, I had a bad day at work. And I'd be like, yeah, we had two babies die today. And they would just be like, whoa. And it was so just not like I was unfazed, not like it never affected me, but it was just so normalized. And so, and that's really how my, all of my trauma was for me. It was just so normalized that I didn't even realize how unusual it was. It just felt so, oh, this is normal. This is my day. This is my job. This is normal. This is my life. This is normal. So it was kind of all that I knew. And then your traumas, I'm going to just nickname them the no good, terrible, awful December. Right? December, it's like you say that word three times and something bad happens. Yeah. I think December 2021 is probably a great jumping off point, right? We're still in the middle of COVID. You are still working full time as a NICU nurse and, and really hadn't uncovered a whole lot of things in your life. But everything came to a screeching halt in December of 2021. And I'm going to let you pick it up from there. Yes, it absolutely did. Screeching halt is, I feel like even an understatement to some degree, but yeah. So I was at the Christmas market downtown in Denver at Civic Center Park. And I was with a group of friends playing with one of their kids. We were spinning around. I just lost my balance, fell backwards, landed on my head. And being a nurse, nurses love to avoid the hospital at all costs. So I did my own neurological assessment on myself and I knew where I was. I knew what happened. I felt okay. And the next morning I woke up with significant facial bruising, which I actually hit in the back of my head. So I knew that meant a skull fracture. It meant that my brain basically hit the front of my face so hard, or the front of my skull so hard that it completely just bruised. And there was a ton of swelling all over my face and I was vomiting and I kept trying to excuse it like, oh, it, it might just be a concussion. It might not be that bad. And I go to the, well, first I go to urgent care and my sweet little boyfriend was like, Mm, we should go to the hospital. I was like, let's start with urgent care. So then we go. Why to- are medical professionals the worst? I, 
in in my book mm-hmm. i talk about this because with all of my previous injuries i always go to urgent care and they're always like why are you here and i'm like ah but we're gonna drive your ass to the er exactly. now in an ambulance Thanks yes for you that. were definitely you were definitely the definition of an urgent care frequent flyer 100 percent. Yes. yes and we're tagged yes. as well that was my right? place again not to give anything <laughs> away in the book <laughs> but <laughs> yes but yeah so then they immediately directed me to the hospital and I was just talking to the doctor. He was assessing me and he was like, yeah, like you seem okay, but given your, uh, your facial appearance and vomiting, let's just go ahead and give you a CT scan. And I had significant hemorrhages, which is active bleeding and a significant hematoma, which is a pool of blood on top of multiple levels on my brain that required emergency brain surgery. And that was an oh shit moment for sure, where I just kind of immediately went into that nurse mode and was like, okay, like this will be fine. This will be fine. This will be fine. After first being like, oh my God, I'm dying. But then I I kind of circled back, got into my zone and was like, okay, went through the surgery. It was awful, but it was okay. It seemed until I had a seizure. I had a life-threatening reaction to a medication. That's a one in a million chance. I ended up also developing a new brain bleed because I was overexerting myself, even though I thought I was resting. I thought I was recovering and taking care of myself and I was facing another brain surgery. And that just brought me to the lowest low I've ever been or I've ever experienced in my life, which I've had depression. I've had anxiety and there was nothing like this. I was just constantly thinking, I wish I never went to the hospital because my surgeon told me if I hadn't gone to the hospital that day, I would have just died in my sleep. And that's all I could think about. And then just, I had this moment where it was almost just like this thought download of just, if I don't change my mindset and start believing that I'm going to heal, then I am going to die. And that was just this catalyst to the shift of, I started meditating and believing that I can heal and visualizing myself healing and listening to audiobooks and podcasts because I couldn't watch TV and I couldn't read during my recovery, all about shifting your mindset and ways to do that. And it was interesting because everything circled back to trauma. And I was like, well, hang on. Like, I don't think I really experienced trauma. Although my therapist has been trying to drill this into my head for like the past three years that, you know, with work and I got divorced and with my five years of health problems and injuries that I had trauma. But as I kind of started to open that door and think, okay, this is worth exploring. Maybe there is more than just the brain injury being a traumatic experience. And that's when the floodgates opened and I learned about and really just was able to identify and recognize all of the traumatic experiences in my life. And I just took this deep dive down to trauma healing and I haven't looked back and it's been a wild ride, but by far the best thing that has ever happened. A couple of things I want to just follow up on. One, I just want to point out for our audience, because this was, I know you talked about this in the book and I think it's really important. And that you were having that sense of like, almost like hopelessness of, I wish I just hadn't gone to the hospital and I wish I, you know, had just died. But what I found very interesting is you had no intent and you had no desire like to self-harm or take your own life. That was just sort of the feeling, right? That you had gotten to of feeling so hopeless. Like if, if I just hadn't done this. I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have to go through all this hard stuff. That's exactly right. I fortunately was not in any self-harming, desiring place. I purely just, I wished I were dead. There's no other way to say that. I just wished I was dead. I wish I hadn't gone to the hospital. I wish one of the complications that had happened after had killed me. I just didn't want to exist anymore. And it was just, it really was a point of pure hopelessness where it just felt like it's just going to keep getting worse. So I just want it to be over. And the other piece is... Prior to this accident, right, there were other traumas, there were other accidents and things, uh, and I urge people, read the book, you'll you'll discover more. You were doing work, right? You Seeing a therapist. There were, mm-hmm. So you were already in the process of working through a whole series of issues, but it took this particular incident to really blow it all apart. And when I think about the inflection points on our healing journeys, that almost second brain surgery for you was the inflection point that really changed everything. Absolutely. I mean, I, speaking of all the bad Decembers, I had um, many Decembers where the, it could have been my wake up call, but it wasn't. And I have, I was a child of therapy. I started doing therapy in middle school 
continued through high school, did it intermittently in college, m- most of my adult life, and then it really consistently since 2020. And yeah, I mean, I was really just scratching the surface and wasn't even allowing myself or my therapist to get to know even those levels of, and depths of what was really going on. And during this time, I was seeing my therapist w- at least once a week, if not more, where I was just bawling my eyes out, just telling her like, how do I get through this? How do I get through this? And she was giving me a lot of advice and uh, a lot of just really great tools and a lot of great support, but it just, it wasn't until that the second brain surgery, exactly right. Where I was like, this could actually like legit kill me. Like I barely skated out of not dying last time. Like this is going to kill me most likely if I don't make it through. And that was just my something's got to change or the answer is it's over. So, I mean, I make the euphemism because I'm stubborn SOB as well. My first therapy was at seven again during college. And then again, a couple years ago. And I make the euphemism of like, yeah, sometimes you have to get clobbered over the head with it. You literally got clobbered over the head with it. Why do you think it takes that? Why do you think even Eric literally had one and then another partial, like full on disassociative episode to be like, well, something's not right. What What is wrong with us? I think it's, I think it's because kind of like, we think we're okay. Like we think, oh, like that just, that's a one-time thing. Like it's okay. Like bad things happen. It's okay. We're all just constantly doing this fake reassurance to ourselves and each other. Like it's okay. Like you'll get through it. It's okay. It'll get better. But no, it, that doesn't actually address the root of the problem. And our, culture really until recently, I feel has been so just like, don't talk about your shit. Don't talk about anything like no exposure to really talking about your feelings and talking about what's going on. I mean, no one in my life knew the severity of what was actually going on in my head and in my body. Yeah. I mean, I've shared it. My brother, once we started the show called me and was like, Hey, I really dig the show. I never knew you were depressed. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, I mean, and honestly, my family was pretty open about it. My mom, There's mental illness on both sides of my lineage. So I never felt the stigma sort of within that unit, but it's also something where like my upbringing was a little strange. My brother is actually my stepbrother. He spent Monday through Friday with his mom and his stepdad. My stepfather who adopted me, who I referred to as my dad was his biological father. And we spent every weekend together. And so the weekends were super compressed and it was fun times. We were either at my grandmother's, our house, or my brother's house and we were and i have an uncle who's only 18 months older than me and we were on full like work furlough man like we were so it just but never really came up and then my bout in college he was in arizona i was back in boston and it just didn't it didn't resonate but it was also i realized that was partially unfair because i was close enough to him that it was something i should have brought up or should have shared with him if nothing else just for the fact that it was something I had gone through and was going through that he should know, right? Like no different, like if I, my shoulder injury, knee injury, he and my uncle actually carried me up a hill after I broke my femur on a skateboard. They were there for all that. Why couldn't they be there when I was hurting in my brain? So there's also something fascinating. And before we go into the arc and a lot of the things you were doing, one of your posts on social media from this past December, actually spurred a bigger question in myself with something that was, I was spiraling just a little bit. And I saw your post and I immediately thought to myself, Laura, wow, the exact same thing is happening to her that's happening to me. And I did it. So I went to my therapist and asked my therapist if if it was a thing. And I'm referring to your post from December of 2023, where you said, I want to be open and I want to be honest. I've been a mess. I'm just paraphrasing. I'm struggling. And it's the anniversary, the two-year anniversary of my TBI. And when I read that, I immediately thought, okay, I here's Laura. Like she has the tools, she has the resources, like she knows what she needs to be able to do. And like, she hasn't asked for help. I haven't asked for help. And then I read sort of the end and I was like, is there PTSD of PTSD? And that's the exact question I asked my therapist. And she said, 
Absolutely. And so I've been really waiting to have you on the show to ask you that, what it was like for you and what you feel PTSD of a PTSD event is like. I, I completely agree. Like I, I mean, December, I am walking on eggshells. I don't do anything. I limit my social interactions as much as I can. I limit my events. I limit things I do because lockdown. <laughs> you put yourself yes, on lockdown. Pretty much. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in a padded room. Yes. You're only allowed to bring me soft things to eat and paper plates. <laughs> Truly, if it weren't for the holidays, I would just lock myself in a room and just be like, I'm good. But yeah, yeah nothing good happens. Yeah, exactly. But no, truly the first December, so 2022, I had been preparing for it with my somatic therapist, my biodynamic craniosacral therapist, who's amazing. And with my EMDR therapist and with my just talk therapist, because I had read all about the, the what's called the anniversary effect or anniversary reaction, where your body knows, your body senses it. And so even if you consciously think, I'm okay, I'm okay, your body will, your nervous system will react, your body will tense up, you will feel differently. And that's exactly how it was for me. So, I mean, the first December 2022 rocked me a lot harder than even 2021 did, weirdly, because. 2021, I was just going through the shock of it all. I was recovering from brain surgery. I was, I had a seizure. I was having all these things happen. You were still, yeah, you were still doing the thing. Right. I was fully in it. But then 2022 was so much worse because I was just grieving the loss almost and just like the complete disruption of my life. Even though it's inevitably led me in a good direction, there's still just the loss of who I was as a person in a lot of ways. And even this December, I was a little smarter to some degree, but also not. At first, I thought, oh, I'll just plan a bunch of things, like some fun things and whatever to do to kind of distract me. And no, that was the dumbest idea ever because what ended up happening was I just completely hit this deep depression, super anxious, lots of panic attacks. And I had to cancel all these things that I had. I like really had to dial down my commitments. And you're exactly right. I know the tools that work for me. I have so much support. I have all these things that can really kind of prevent, I say with quotations, prevent me from getting to this point, but it doesn't because I truly do have PTSD around December. I have PTSD around the dates of various other events and things that happened. And I just even, I'm sure you guys can relate, but I have PTSD of even just the fear of remembering things that happened sometimes, like when memories pop up. I'm always still to some degree on this hypervigilant, high alert state, even when I try not to be, because someone will bring something up that'll remind me of something that happened to me as a child or something that happened in my adult life that just brings me to this deep, dark, anxious state. So yeah, it's a constant fluctuation of living living and experiencing the PTSD and managing it and feeling free from it. So if you could, you mentioned meditation and I love the healing team you've put together. That sounds amazing. Shout out but, to Andrew. You know, for yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, but for yourself, what is it you find that are the habits, that are the things that best allow you to, I love the fact that you said it hurt, but I said, no, I canceled things. I suck at this. I am the worst and I've gotten marginally better, but it's really hard because, and for me, it isn't even admitting that I'm not okay or admitting that I don't have enough energy or time. It's I'm not willing to be like, no, I, I want to do that. I should be able to do that. I mean, I'm literally, tonight I've been working straight through since seven o'clock this morning. And when we get off this recording, I'm going to eat dinner with my wife and then go listen to jazz because I've canceled on these people. A good friend is in town and a good friend is playing and I've canceled on them twice this season. And I'm like, if I don't do it now, I'm not going to have any more time in later in February or March. So now's the time. But even my wife is like, what, why are you doing? Why are you going to do that? Tonight? I'm like, I have to, which isn't true. I want to. And one of the things I've learned is to switch this whole idea from like, I have to, or I want to, I get to do this. So I just love to hear some of those things and especially meditation, which I have found to be incredibly powerful for myself. So, absolutely. So, I mean, I love meditating. That is the one thing that I will carve out every day time to do, even if it's as little as five minutes, we all have five minutes. Like it makes such a difference. But for me, it's all it takes to, that really, was the biggest thing I had to learn. Like once you get better at it, it just, the, the quiet mind, I can actually in about 90 seconds, get a very 
fulfilled feeling from it now. It's great. Yeah. And there's a lot of research to support that five minutes is really all that you need to really see a lot of significant changes in your brain and your nervous system. So meditation is a big one. The other one, actually, my big intention for 2024, which I've so far been practicing pretty well, has been not feeling the pressure of obligations and letting that control me because I just know, I mean, this is just a challenging time for me. December, January, February is just, it's a tough time just given my history and things that have happened. And so I have been a lot better about giving myself more grace. And if I have to cancel stuff because I don't have the energy or I'm getting sick, or I just feel like I can't handle that. I felt my anxiety has just been really high lately compared to my baseline. And so I've just been really paring things down. And I used to look at that as, well, I can't do that. I've already committed. And well, what if that means that I don't get this opportunity again? And I've just completely reframed my mindset where instead I'm like, I I have to focus on my well-being. Like that has to be my number one priority. So what that looks like now is I have a very long morning routine where I meditate, I journal, I do EFT tapping. I take time to make a nice breakfast before I start my day. Even when I'm working in the hospital, I wake up a full hour before, which sucks because it's early, but I have to have that time. I was going to say, what time does your shift start? My shift starts at 6.45 in the morning and I wake up. Oh, just how long is your commute? It's only 20 minutes, but I wake up. That's not bad, but that means you're getting up a little after five. I'm getting up at five, which I worked night shift for 10 years. So this is wildly unpleasant for me. Great, great. But, but yeah, so I know that I need that just for my baseline well-being. Like, I think it's really important to figure out and everyone's different. I think it's super individualized. A lot of people aren't, I mean, I'm not a morning person, which is why I make it a leisurely morning activity. Because if I go into the day feeling rushed, I'm anxious all day. There's like no escaping that. It comes, it's become so much harder to kind of deactivate myself. But a lot of people don't feel that way and like to have breaks during the day to do something else or go for a walk. That's been another thing. I mean, thankfully being in Denver, we get the sun. So walking is pretty easy, but I think it just comes down to finding whatever works best for people that allows them to carve out the time for their mental and physical health and really prioritize that. Because for me, I know that the second I start, and this is exactly what happened in December, I started to feel anxious. I started to feel depressed. I started to feel like my schedule and my life was controlling me and I had no control over anything. And I just reached a really unfortunately low point where I was just like, fuck this. Like, this is awful. I can't go on this way. Like not in a, like a wanting to wishing I were dead, like Mm -hmm. previously scenario, but more just like, this is not a functional way to live. And I I have to do something about it. And that meant significantly paring down my schedule, my life, backing off, focusing on sleep and focusing on just my wellness. And it's such an important message for our audience, right? Because we always talk about our mental health journeys as journeys and twists and turns, and they're forever changing. And here you are talking about your very own, right? And no, even knowing December is coming up and even planning for it, right? Things still come at us out of left field. And there's, there are so many things we want to control and we just don't have the ability to. So I really, I thank you for, you know, being so transparent and vulnerable while it was happening. It, It helped me tremendously. So thank you. And to share that experience with our audience, Speaking of different modalities, and we always love when we have guests on the show who have done things that we may not have either talked about, or in in this case, I hadn't even heard about it before. And you talked a lot about EMDR being a big piece for you and the combination of EMDR with somatic experience or SE which goes under this larger umbrella of the Hakomi therapy. And I had never heard of that. I actually was Googling it and trying to discover it a lot. And so for our audience, can you take us and them through how you discovered that and how that has been able to become such a big part of your healing journey, both from your accident and even present day? Absolutely. So I actually stumbled into Hakomi method therapy, which Hakomi method is a culmination of it's basically all centered around mindfulness and connecting to your body through somatic therapy, through EMDR, through a lot of different tools. There's also internal family systems theories. It just basically intertwines a ton of different, more holistic therapies to connect you to your mind, your body, and yourself. 
And I kind of stumbled into it because I was looking for an EMDR therapist and I had read the Hakomi method and I was like, cool, don't really know what that is. Kind of just did a quick, quick Google search, thought, cool, this sounds great. Let's do it. And I expected it to be just consistent EMDR therapy, which EMDR is, there's so many different types of trauma therapies, but that is one that is super well researched, super top tier, really helpful for a lot of people. And I thought it was going to be every session. We're just diving into EMDR, which is such a fascinating modality because you're basically just kind of, your brain just does weird stuff with various eye movements where you're able to access memories and pinpoint things that your conscious brain kind of blocks. So it's a really unique way to process and kind of integrate really trim process or integrate and process really traumatic experiences. But with a Comey method, I mean, we were doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, there would be a lot of sessions with, uh, it would be a somatic focus or it would just kind of naturally turn that way. And even one time we did a session where she, we were, it was all about boundaries and she had me draw like a circle with a string around my body and be able to expand that and push that outward. But it's really just a lot about tuning into yourself because I know I was guilty of this and my, and still am. And many of us are where we just get stuck in our heads. We just get stuck in our heads and think that our anxious thoughts and intrusive thoughts are, are it. That's all that there is out there. And so by introducing more of these different therapies, I mean, Hakomi method, the EMDR, that was huge. Somatic experiencing was also huge because for me, so much of my trauma was physical and it was a way that I didn't have to necessarily relive those experiences, but allow my body to release it. Because for me, a lot of my trauma manifested as chronic pain, chronic tension, and a lot of things in my body, nausea, dissociation. And so that was super helpful. But I mean, I could go through the laundry list of all the therapies mm -hmm. but that I did, but because it was interesting. As I started down my trauma healing journey, I first started with somatic experiencing, then moved on to EMDR and things like that and hypnotherapy. But I just kept learning more and finding more and being like, okay, and I hate using this term, but I still feel broken, which I wasn't broken, but I felt like, oh, I would do this therapy and think, okay, I've done this for two months. I should feel a certain way. And I didn't. And I would get super low again and then would kind of start pursuing another therapy additionally. And it kind of got to a point where it got unmanageable. I was doing like five therapies at once, which kind of brought me to a lower point in a different way, which I realized I had to scale back. But moral of this long story is that I think it all just really needs to be super individualized. You need to figure out the therapies that are right for you because there's no just blanket treatment like, oh, this is going to work for you or whatever. You have to find the right therapist. I think that's also huge. I talk about in my book. I had an experience with a hypnotherapist that was incredibly traumatizing and a huge learning curve for me. But it really just comes down to learning about different things, trying different things, trying different therapists and seeing what fits because it's not one size fits all. And for me, it was also the timing of things. If I had started with EMDR and Hakomi method, I, I would have dropped out of therapy real fast. I needed the more gentle approach of somatic experiencing where it wasn't just this direct, let's just attack these, not attack, but just directly hit these traumatic experiences and traumatic memories. Instead, it kind of more goes around in a gentler way, a more indirect way. And that's what I needed. So I think that's really important to take into account for everybody that it is such an individualized process. Well, and I know I'm lucky enough to have two, one colleague and one very close friend who's a somatic therapist. And my, my background in acting. And this person's actually the mother of one of my really close colleagues from college. And we've talked, she's an amazing woman. She actually got her PhD when she was like 72. And it's always interesting to me because I feel like it's a very difficult thing for people to process that their body holds trauma. And so I'm wondering what your experience was directly with that and the understanding of the frame. Because you, you made a statement that really ignited my brain when you talked about how you could essentially treat or resolve that trauma within your body without reliving it, right? And to me, knowing so many people who are survivors of sexual assault, you know, child abuse, all these like awful things, which unfortunately in some type of behavioral and cognitive and behavioral therapy, sometimes you do actually have to kind of go down that road. Telling your story is a huge part of that, telling it out loud. But I just want to hear a little bit about your experience of like realizing that it was in your body and you could actually heal from it and what that experience was like. Well, for me, I was just so disconnected from my body. Like 
when I say I feel like I didn't have a lot of sensations, a lot of people don't really know what that means, but a lot of people with complex trauma do because I had a high pain tolerance. I never really felt tired, even though I would sleep for three hours between a night shift and work for 15 hours. And I never, like my baseline was just kind of not feeling. And I recognized that this wasn't great. I was able to at least consciously recognize that. But when I kind of started going down this rabbit hole of just exploring, maybe there is more under the hood with trauma with me. A lot of it did come down to, there's the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which I have a love-hate relationship with. But it, it really just does come down to your body does hold on to it differently. So the two outside of somatic experiencing, the other two most impactful therapies that I that I utilized that were either aimed at the body, well, aimed, both were aimed at the body, but you didn't have to relive, were biodynamic craniosacral therapy and rapid resolution therapy. So biodynamic craniosacral therapy is kind of, I mean, I equate it kind of like nervous system Reiki. So um, my practitioner will, sometimes memories will come up, but oftentimes they don't. And it's very slow. It's, I, I still see her. I love her to death. Her name is Margaret. She's wonderful. And it's very slow and it's very focused on just basically allowing your body and your nervous system to get comfortable with sensation with being able to focus on areas of the body and not even needing to relive memories, but allowing for basically the practitioner to help you like move those, move the energy and resolve those trauma cycles within the body. So occasionally memories come up, but often they don't. And, but I'll feel sensations of cool or heat in an area or like a whoosh feeling or just different sensations, heaviness, lightness. And I can feel my body working through it, but I don't have to consciously relive it. And with rapid resolution therapy, that's aimed at the unconscious mind. And so a lot of it does come down to rewiring your brain, rewiring your nervous system, but you're not actually having to relive these experiences because I've gotten to the point where I've relived it enough. I don't want to do it anymore. EMDR was helpful. A lot of talk therapy has been helpful, but I don't want to have to keep talking about it. I can in different capacities, but when it's getting to the root of, from a therapeutic perspective, it's no longer helpful to me. So what is helpful to me is doing these other approaches where I'm still able to heal and still able to move forward, but I'm not needing to ball it for an hour in the corner afterwards because I'm just reliving this traumatic memory. It can come from a completely different place and still have the same, if not better levels of healing, in my opinion. And it's an important point that you bring up. And I've experienced it in my own therapy. I know others who have as well. There's the right treatment modality at the right time in the right amount. And I'd I'd love to hear you talk a little more about it because I've given it a lot of thought. And in my own healing journey is this idea of you, and you hinted toward it earlier, well, you, you discover one thing and you do it and then you discover another and you do it. And so we think, well, if a little is great, then a lot must be amazing. And so we jump into all these different things when the reality is what our body and our mind need at different times is drastically different. And I love how you talked about talk therapy and EMDR was like a piece of it. And now you've realized the body stores trauma and it's time to work on more treatment modalities that work somatically as opposed to just cognitively. Absolutely. And I was always a live fast, move fast, go a million miles an hour kind of person expecting fast results. And I initially was that way with my trauma healing journey. I thought, okay, I'm doing all this work. It's got to move the needle. It's got to get better. It's got to get better. But that's not reality. To rewire your brain and rewire your nervous system in a safe way that changes are actually going to stick, it takes time. It takes repetition. It takes a place of safety, which is huge. Because for me, I was doing so much therapy in these places where I didn't feel safe fully with this person, or I didn't even feel fully safe with myself. And really learning internal safety has been paramount for me in my healing journey. But for me, a lot of it really came down to the fact that I was just going, just doing. That's the way that I always did things. But then when I was able to really slow down and recognize that this is not helpful, it's not helpful if I'm, you know, spending eight hours a week doing various therapies, but then I spend another 10 hours just crying and napping because I feel so depleted, that's not going anywhere. That's not making a difference in the right way. So when I really kind of slowed down, which took a while, 
for me to really recognize that. When I really slowed down and recognized that I can do this in stages, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It really speaks to my therapeutic journey. And I think for many where it's just, it's going to take time and it sucks because there's going to be moments that absolutely suck. I can fully attest to that. However, I know that as I've continued to do this work, it does continue to get better. I am slowly just progressing in, in all the right directions and constantly kind of having to reframe and remind myself that has been really important. How did you come to the conclusion though? Because it, it, it's something Eric and I have shared about our own journeys about how the sort of ebb and flow and getting comfortable with this idea of like, there'll be strides forward. Sometimes there's a step back. Sometimes it isn't even life. It's just different things. How did you kind of come to that conclusion or realize the sort of long game versus the short game of like how that works? This year, I thought I was like, this is going to be my year. Like I've done all this healing, like my book's coming out. Things are going to be great. This year was harder than 2022 by far. I feel like I was just caught in the waves. I was just getting crashed and crashed on. I'd have these like moments of catching a breath and then just another crash. And it's really been kind of the last month, two months where I really recognized like, this is just going to be how it is. Not like I should give up or stop, but there's always going to be moments that are hard. There's always going to be moments of challenge. I'm going to have moments of struggle. I'm not just going to one day wake up and be like, oh, no more anxiety, no more depression. Like, feel great. Like, that's just not reality. I'm going to have moments come up. And I really just feel for me, what's helped me is just kind of that reminder of I am generally trending in the right direction. I am at least 51% of the time feeling good, feeling happy where I am, comfortable with my mental health and physical health. And yes, I still have those moments. Sometimes it is up to 49% in a month. Usually it's lower, but sometimes it is even more actually, more of the month where I feel unwell and I don't feel like myself. But the more that I do this and the more that I kind of stay at the slow pace, which I found best for me, I do just ultimately feel better. And I think it's it's really one of the things that I realized because I was always kind of like I said earlier, go, go. I felt like I always had to stick to my obligations. I said yes to this person, I have to follow through and really just prioritizing my health and my mental health and, and wellness is just kind of the number one that I'm going into this year with. No, what you say is incredible. And, and it is this like dance between like self-awareness, self-care and like sort of that understanding approach. I mean, I had a really cool conversation recently uh, with, with a very close loved one who basically was like, I realized I had to be able to like live with myself in the quiet. And I was like, yeah, that's the scary shit. <laughs> like, I, I was like, I was like, that's, I'm not good at that yet. I mean, I've gotten a lot better at it, but it's honestly one of the reasons why I have all these weird hobbies. Like it's way easier for me to focus on playing guitar or tuning my skis instead of laying in bed, not being able to sleep. What did it feel like in that moment, Laura, when you allowed yourself to accept that was what the journey was going to be. I was sobbing, sobbing. I actually, I've been working with a coach who's been amazing, who has helped me with a lot of nervous system regulation and just moving forward in life in a positive direction. And we basically talked for an hour and a half and it was me just kind of bawling about how like this is, just going to be a part of the journey. There's going to be parts like this and it's going to look different every time. Sometimes it'll be not as hard. Sometimes it may be harder, but this is just a part of the journey. And I just sat, I can see it. I remember this so well. I, sat, I was in this other room, just staring at the ceiling, just hanging out with my cats. My boyfriend would check on me and he was like, you okay? And I would just be like, yeah, like I was just sobbing and I was just taking it in because I really needed to just take it in. And I was just literally staring at the ceiling crying, just thinking, you know, this is the path that I've chosen and I've chosen it for a reason. I want to keep moving forward on this path for healing myself for sharing my story to help others heal. So people don't end up in this situation and, or that they can heal from it. And it's just the lows suck, but they're still worth it. I will say I've spent a lot of January, just not great. And I had to take a lot of time off to really just kind of reset because I was so depressed and so anxious and just feeling just terrible. And what that looked like was a lot of just 
sitting with my feelings, which I never used to do that. Like no chance. I was out the door doing something in a heartbeat. Like there was no way. And for me now it's journaling, it's meditating. It's sometimes just sitting, staring at the ceiling. It's it's doing different things, just being with myself and working through it because the I realized that the more I was avoiding my feelings, the more afraid I was of them. And yeah, like, don't get me wrong. It sucks to feel like crap. Absolutely. But if I'm afraid of it, I'm going to do whatever I can to avoid it. I'm basically telling my brain that like, this is scary. This is bad. Avoid. But if I'm able to sit with it, I get through it so much faster. And even though, and faster sometimes might still be a full week, not ideal, but I know that I'm able to work through it so much better when I truly take that time. You speak to that so well, and it's, and it's such a hard lesson and important lesson. And just kind of, kind of turn your mind's eye back and think about this. We may have a listener or a loved one of a listener listening right now that's in one of your Decembers. And if you could talk to yourself or talk to them, what would you tell them to do? Look at the why. Why? Why? I mean, I'm speaking to me specifically. Why was I a perfectionist? Why was I always on the go? Why was I needing to get fucked up constantly? Why was I needing to be the best person always in the gym and the best person at work and the best in everything, the best in my friend group? Why did I always need to do that? Where did that come from? And once you start peeling back those layers, you'll learn the answers and kind of the experiences and the beliefs that were established at early ages as to why. And for me, it was really mind blowing because especially just through a lot of self-reflection and then also through a lot of EMDR and kind of identifying specific memories that I wouldn't have necessarily identified as this is traumatic. They instilled beliefs that completely changed the trajectory of how I thought about myself. And so once you kind of start peeling back those layers and you're able to get to those roots, it can really change everything because you realize that you don't, this doesn't have to be your truth. This doesn't have to be a reality. We are all capable of changing our beliefs changing our mindsets and it takes work, but it's absolutely doable. Something I just want to touch on briefly. Um, you know, you stepped away in June of 2022, if I could have my dates right from your career. And I know so many people in the healthcare profession that they put so much into it that it, in some ways it almost becomes who they are. And they're so compassionate and so empathetic. And you stepped away. And now here you are, a much better version of your former self. And that's how I refer to myself now. And as you said, you're dipping your toe back in the water. How do you think the new version of Laura will be able to come to being a NICU nurse? in a different way. Do you think the change that you've gone through personally will change how you go about your day-to-day -day job? Oh, I, I could answer this and like, oh, I could write a whole book about this <laughs> answer because there's so much just complexity to it. So for me, that's actually- You can do actually, another episode and you can write Yeah, you can write a book. There it is. <laughs> like that actually, going back to the hospital- was part of why my December and January were so challenging because my identity was who I was at work. And I'm back on the same unit with the same people, which I absolutely love, but it has been incredibly challenging to not be that Laura anymore, to not be that I stay late. I'm constantly picking up overtime. I'm throwing myself in any emergency. And it was almost like I've been grieving a loss of that Laura which not that I want to go back to that because she was fucking nuts. I say that in a loving way, <laughs> but like, it was just, it was so unpleasant. I can't, I don't even know how I'm Read the book. It'll in detail that, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've all been, we've all been in love with crazy, whether it was ourselves or a right. partner. Let's be real. Right. But, <laughs> and our Amy's, these two prizes are their crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but so it's been really challenging because my brain and my nervous system have just, Oh, we're back here. We're back in this environment. Let's go back to those habits. So I've had to work really hard to break those old habits and break that constant need to put everything above myself. And I've really so far done a decent job of taking time to step away to do like a quick meditation or to do some deep breathing or get outside if I can, because I know that 
I like now that I'm so much more in tune with my body, I can feel the like the heightening level of my nervous system going up. And I'm just like, I have to do something about this now. And so I'm glad that I have that awareness. Sometimes working in the challenging, acute world of the NICU, I don't always have those options. So that's hard too, because it's like, I feel myself getting really amped up. I feel that I need to calm myself down, but I can't right now. So that's been really hard. So it's, I'm still in the navigating phase. So I'm curious where it's going to go. It's been overall positive. It's just been a lot more challenging than I expected in different ways. Well, I mean, good for you for that very insightful self-appraisal and accepting decent and weird and I don't know and navigating because that's hard. I mean, I'll be honest, like I'm the worst at that. Like I am, oof, I like, I don't like to make mistakes. I don't like to be able to do it. And I don't like it when the environment pushes me into a place where I don't want to go. I, oh, I get, oh. So good for you. And I think that's amazing. And I want to make sure um, that people know where to find you and your work and especially the book and anything else you'd like to share, whether it's socials or other ways you communicate with people. Absolutely. So my book, No, I'm Not Fine, Thank You, is available on Amazon and it is in Petals and Pages in Denver, if you're local to Denver. I'm working on getting it elsewhere currently, but those are the only current places. My website- You should get in touch with Explore Booksellers in Aspen. Sweet. I'll absolutely do that. Uh, we'll, we'll send you the contact. Awesome. Um, also my website, uh, it's laurarenner.me, M-E. Um, you can get in touch with me there. I also have a free beginner's guide to trauma healing where I kind of break down a lot of the resources that I relied very heavily on and still used in a lot of ways to just kind of dip your toes in, or even just kind of start exploring different modalities in the trauma healing field. And then I'm also on Instagram and TikTok, actually, Laura underscore Ren, R-E-N-N. I know I broke into TikTok. I avoided it for so long. It's like, I, I don't want to do this. I'm not a big social media person. We have, we have a dog. I just took TikTok. the dive into hey. threads earlier this week. Oh. oh, I'm on threads, but I never actually go there. <laughs> yeah, I was told that I should get a Twitter. And I'm like, I just, no. yeah. this all just, it, uh, it's no nope. threads. Threads, threads is the next <laughs> Social thing, media is like... just not my jam. Personally, I like to keep it more personal yeah. and fun. And I do like to intermittently sprinkle in some good therapeutic stuff. But so I'm kind of hit or miss on there. But those are the places I'm, I'm a social me. media voyeur. And yeah, go ahead and send me your funny videos <laughs> and memes, especially if they include pets doing weird things you can ask eric it's either people exploding on skis doing something cool on skis or pets doing weird shit love it so th that's i'm all about it i I'm cooking i love cooking videos eric laura you like thank you so so much for being on the show so many incredible insights and i know our audience have hearing just the small part of your story will no doubt be inspired one to go and purchase the book which is incredible it's super witty. It's sprinkled with lots of sarcasm. And I know when I was reading it, there were so many different pieces of it that I connected with. Uh, and you and I talked about it before we came on Two very specific examples that you went through and I went through growing up in, in completely different places in the world. So thank you again for that. And especially for dipping your toe back into uh, the healthcare world. The the NICU will be a much better place with you in it. And, and I know there are many families who will find peace and solace knowing that you are in the hospital and looking after their little ones. And like Mark said, we, we have plenty of guest rooms and plenty of space up here in the mountains. And so there's no need for you to experience FOMO. I know we won't get you on snow, which is a good thing, but we can walk around we can and we can hiking, go hiking and, and, sp and spending time skiing, in the summer. Fast. So you're, I'll, I'll cheer you. I'll cheer you on from the You're side always side. welcome on this side of the continental <laughs> divide. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been such a treat to talk to you both today. I really appreciate it. The treat was all ours and no lie. I was just on Amazon ordering because now I can read the book. I'm not allowed to do any research <laughs> beforehand. So a copy of No, I'm Not Fine, Thank You is on its way to my house. And I'm going to be sending one to a person who's very special to me as well. Amazing. And Laura, I, I cannot thank you enough for all the work you've done on yourself and for others. And like Eric said, especially in that NICU, having had two friends go through that so close to me right now, I'm like, that's, and I just, I can't thank you enough. And it has been an absolute pleasure. So 
Thank you so much to our incredible guest, Laura Renner. Go ahead and get out there and buy that book to my ever-loving co-host, Eric DeRosa. This is Mark Fernandes from Survivor to Thriver, episode 154. And I will leave us with these words, as I always do. Let's please all be as well as we can. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review. Also, we'd love if you could share this episode with a friend and encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or email via the links in our show notes. See you next week.